using silviculture to maintain and enhance wildlife habitat. This presentation was developed and is presented by Matt Tarr, Extension Professor and State Specialist Wildlife Habitat for the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension. I designed this presentation primarily to assist professional foresters and wildlife biologists become better at predicting how wildlife will respond to the decisions we make when managing forested habitats, but the information should be useful to anyone interested in understanding how wildlife are likely to respond to different methods for managing forested habitats using timber harvesting. This presentation is organized into three sections. In section one, I provide a summary of the primary factors that influence how wildlife respond to timber harvesting. These are on-site and surrounding landscape factors that you can recognize and that wildlife look for and respond to as they select their habitat. In section two, I summarize some important considerations regarding preferences and requirements of different birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. This information allows you to better understand why certain wildlife occur on a property today and how wildlife are likely to respond to any changes we make to the habitat. And in section three, I summarize the ways that different groups of wildlife are most likely to respond to the even-aged and uneven-aged silvicultural treatments that are used most commonly to manage forested habitats in New England. This YouTube video is also divided into chapters based on the specific topics I discuss. Those chapters are in the video description below, and you can use them to easily rewatch specific parts of the presentation you are most interested in. Section 1. Primary Factors Influencing How Wildlife Respond to Timber Harvesting Anytime we cut trees, there are a number of interacting factors that are important for determining how wildlife will respond. These include how the timber harvest affects plant structure within the harvest area, the plant species composing the habitat where we are working, the size of the canopy opening we create, whether the timber harvest occurred on dry, moist, or wet soils, the presence or absence of special habitat features such as snags or large coarse woody material, and what habitats are in the landscape surrounding the area where we are working. I'll now elaborate on the factors of plant structure and plant species composition because they are the basis for almost everything else we need to consider when managing habitat for wildlife. Plant structure simply means identifying what plant layers are present in the habitat and how dense are the plants within each of those layers. In any habitat, look for the presence or absence of plants occurring within four primary layers. Starting at the ground, look for the ground cover layer that includes herbaceous and woody plants growing zero to two feet tall, the shrub layer that includes shrubs and young trees two to 10 feet tall, the mid-story layer of tall shrubs and trees 10 to 30 feet tall, and the canopy layer of trees taller than 30 feet. And within each layer that is present, determine whether the plant coverage within that layer is sparse, intermediate, or dense coverage of each layer is estimated as if you were looking down into the stand from above and deciding how much of the ground is covered by the plants within that layer. Sparse coverage is where the plants within a layer cover less than 30% of the ground. Intermediate coverage is where plant cover is 30 to 75% and dense coverage is over 75%. As a general rule, forest stands composed of multiple plant layers tend to support a greater diversity of wildlife species then stands composed of fewer layers, because more layers means there's more niches or opportunities to meet the needs of different wildlife. But with that said, we don't want all vegetation layers present in every forest stand. This is because some wildlife species prefer or require forest habitats that have no or only a sparse overstory layer. These wildlife include the shrubland or young forest dependent birds, such as prairie warblers, eastern towhees, indigo buntings, and brown thrashers. Other wildlife such as little brown bats, northern long-eared bats, broadwing hawks, and northern goshawks prefer forest with a closed or partially open overstory, but little or no midstory layer, because a dense midstory layer inhibits their ability to move and forage efficiently within the stand. Snowshoe hares prefer habitats with areas where the shrub layer is dominated by very dense conifers. This provides them with the best protection from predators. And because these are the habitats where hares are most common and abundant, these habitats are also preferred by bobcats throughout New Hampshire and lynx in very northern New Hampshire because hares are one of their preferred prey. 
Some birds, such as black-throated blue warblers, prefer to nest in mature forest habitats that have a very dense deciduous shrub and ground layer. Chipmunks also prefer areas of dense understory cover because this dense cover makes it difficult for hawks and mammalian predators to locate and capture small mammals. You may not know it, but chipmunks are predators that eat songbird nestlings. Therefore, many forest nesting birds, such as oven birds, which make their nests on the ground, and viries, which nest on the ground or in the forest shrub layer, prefer to nest in forest stands where the shrub and ground cover layer is intermediate. Such stands provide enough cover for birds to hide their nests, but not so much cover that chipmunks can roam free and escape being captured by predators. Therefore, to support the greatest variety of wildlife across a landscape, we want all forest layers present somewhere within that landscape. We want to encourage and maintain some stands composed of all forest layers, adjacent to or nearby other stands that lack one or more layers, and we want the vegetation density within those layers to vary among stands. Thankfully, since wildlife species don't recognize property boundaries, you don't need to have all forest layers on your land. Instead, when planning a timber sale, look for opportunities to create or maintain forest layers and plant structure that's different than what occurs on neighboring properties. This is the best way to enhance habitat diversity across the landscape and to give wildlife a reason to use your property by providing them with habitat opportunities that they can't get elsewhere. The tree, shrub, and herbaceous plant species we decide to remove, retain, or encourage while timber harvesting has an important influence on how and when different wildlife will use different forest stands as habitat on our property and across the landscape. Since each plant species has its own type of flower, seed, and fruit in its specific flowering and fruiting season, plant species diversity within a forest stand and across the property directly influences what foods are available to wildlife and what time of year wildlife will visit different areas of the property to forage. When timber harvesting, always consider retaining and providing growing room for mast producing tree species that are unique to the property you are managing and uncommon in other areas of the local landscape. There's a few no-brainer species here that I think most folks regularly retain while timber harvesting. These include white oak, shagbark hickory, and black cherry that all produce nuts or fruit that are relished by wildlife. These trees usually don't have very high timber value on most properties in New England, but their wildlife value as a food source is exceptionally high. Don't forget the birches here too. Yellow birch is at the top of the list for wildlife value. It not only produces abundant seeds that fall onto the snow and are readily eaten by wintering songbirds, but all of the birches, and yellow birch especially, regularly support a huge abundance of caterpillars that nesting birds require for raising their young. Many raptors also locate their nests in the forked branch structure of mature yellow birch trees. Now, in addition to influencing fruit and seed availability, plant species diversity influences insect species composition and diversity. Plant species composition has an especially important influence on the abundance of herbivorous insects, such as caterpillars, which are important in their own right, but caterpillars are also one of the most important food items that most songbirds require for raising large broods of young. As a general rule, native plants tend to support a greater abundance and diversity of caterpillars than non-native plants, so habitats composed of a diversity of native plant species are those that are most likely to support a diversity and abundance of caterpillars. Native plants that tend to support the greatest abundance of caterpillars include oaks, cherries, willows, and birches, and birds regularly concentrate their foraging activity on these plants because that's where caterpillars are most predictably abundant. These are great plants to encourage on sites where these species are best adapted to grow. Finally, plant species is also important for influencing the cover component of a habitat, and softwoods usually provide wildlife with the best year-round protection from wind and precipitation and wildlife of all kinds will regularly retreat to softwood cover during inclement weather. Due to their branching structure and short, dense needles, hemlocks, spruce, fir, and cedars provide superior cover from snow than do pines, and forest stands that provide the best winter cover for wildlife are those where crown closure of these conifer species exceeds 75%. 
meaning that when you are in the stand and look up, at least 75% of the sky will be blocked by live softwood foliage. In regenerating openings, forest edges, and especially in hedgerows, plants that grow very dense provide some of the most preferred nesting substrates for birds, because dense plants are able to visually conceal nests from predators. Such plants include very dense hardwood stump sprouts and large dense shrubs, including multiflora rose and autumn olive. So don't be in such a rush to remove these non-native shrubs if there aren't other plants in the habitat that can serve a similar habitat function. One of the most important take-home messages from this presentation is that a diverse plant community results in a diverse wildlife community. So forest stands that have multiple plant layers composed of many plant species are likely to support more wildlife than stands that have plant layers composed of fewer species. So for example, for many reasons, we don't want beech to comprise all forest layers. So as we are planning and implementing timber harvests, plan harvests in a manner that aim to maintain and encourage plant species diversity in each layer of the forest. But recognize that diversity occurs across a number of different scales, from within a stand, to across multiple stands on a single property, to across multiple properties within the local and regional landscape. So a single forest stand dominated by one or two plant species could actually add to the habitat diversity of a property or landscape if the remaining stands in those areas are more diverse. So that brings us to another important take-home message. Manage your property in a manner that complements other properties in the landscape. Look for opportunities to maintain or encourage plant species that are absent from or less common on other nearby properties. Doing so enhances habitat diversity in the neighborhood and makes your property more attractive to wildlife by giving them a reason to visit your land. Okay, I spent some time discussing plant structure and plant species composition specifically because they are the factors that underlie most of our forest management considerations and decisions, and they are often the most critical factors that influence habitat selection by wildlife. The remaining factors of the size of the canopy opening we create during timber harvesting and the soil type where we conduct the timber harvest directly influence the plant structure and plant species composition we can expect following the harvest. Interest in creating or maintaining special habitat features to attract specific wildlife species and how our property compares to other properties in the surrounding landscape provide further guidance for which habitat features are or aren't unique and if and where different size openings are appropriate for encouraging plant structure and plant species that will be most beneficial to wildlife on our property and in our neighborhood. These additional factors are tools and guidance for working with the habitat on our land, and they also have their own direct influence on how wildlife use our land. Those effects are best explained and understood in the next section of the presentation, where I will address some taxa-specific considerations for how different groups of wildlife select their habitat. And we'll first look at habitat selection by birds. I'll spend the most time on birds because there are many species, which means as a community, their habitat requirements in response to changes in habitat structure caused by timber harvesting is quite variable and is perhaps the most nuanced compared to mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. Also, because birds have such varied habitat and space requirements, managing our landscape to accommodate the needs of a complete bird community is an effective way to create a landscape able to support the full diversity of all other vertebrate and invertebrate wildlife species. Perhaps more than any other taxa, habitat selection by birds begins with the structure of the habitat. One early bird researcher called this a bird's niche gestalt, which was a fancy way of saying what the habitat looks like, recognizing that most bird species tend to occur predictably within habitats that have a specific recognizable arrangement of plant layers and structure. For example, oven birds are most commonly encountered in mature forest habitats that have a nearly closed overstory layer, an intermediate midstory and shrub layer, and a dense layer of deciduous leaf litter. Common yellowthroats are most common in habitats that have absent or sparse overstory and midstory layers, an intermediate shrub layer, and a dense herbaceous ground layer and warbling vireos are most common where there are tall, large-crowned, mature hardwood trees immediately adjacent to a pond, a large river, or a field. 
Habitat structure is what we believe birds use as the first cue to whether they are in the right habitat or not. With practice, you can learn to readily recognize different patterns of vegetation structure and use those patterns to predict what birds are likely to occur in a habitat now and predict how different bird species are likely to respond if you change vegetation structure during timber harvesting. A challenge is that there's a lot of bird species out there, and they all have their own preferences and requirements for habitat structure. So if you really want to be sure how a timber harvest is going to affect birds and other wildlife, be sure to reach out to UNH Cooperative Extension or to other wildlife professionals to help you assess the habitat and plan the timber harvest. But in regards to the birds that use some sort of forest habitat, an easy place to start is to recognize that most forest birds can be placed into one of two groups based on the coarse structure of the habitat they require for nesting. These are the birds that nest in young forest or shrubland habitat, and we often call these the young forest birds, shrubland birds, or shrubland dependent birds. And there's the birds that nest in mature forest habitats. These are often called mature forest birds or forest interior birds. Here in New Hampshire, we have about 36 species of young forest birds that require regenerating forest or other shrub-dominated habitats as their primary nesting habitat. These species include common yellowthroat, chestnut-sided warbler, prairie warbler, eastern towhee, and brown thrasher. And we have about 34 species of mature forest birds that require mature forest as their primary nesting habitat. These include scarlet tanager, black burnian warbler, black-throated green warbler, wood thrush, and northern goshawk. It's important to recognize that this coarse but helpful grouping of birds is based on the vegetation structure they prefer or require specifically for nesting. Birds from both groups readily forage in young forest habitats during and after the nesting season, and especially during migration. Therefore, even most of the mature forest birds prefer habitats that include at least small areas of young forest structure, which can include wetland edges or small gap openings created via timber harvesting. So just what is young forest or mature forest as far as birds are concerned? Most foresters are probably familiar with this figure that provides a very simplified illustration of the different stages of succession a forest stand progresses through if allowed to regenerate on its own following a clear cut that removes the entire forest overstory. For birds, young forest conditions and the young forest birds typically appear early within the first year or two of the stand initiation stage, and these conditions and birds usually disappear very early in the stem exclusion stage. The specific habitat structure that attracts the young forest birds includes the open or sparse overstory and midstory layers. Most young forest birds prefer an overstory where the canopy layer is absent or where canopy closure is less than 30% closed. These birds are attracted to patches of dense herbaceous vegetation and areas of exposed soil that are common the first year or two following clear cutting. They are attracted to the intermediate to dense shrub layer that typically occurs three to 10 years after clear cutting. And many young forest birds prefer some tall saplings growing scattered amongst the shrubs because they use tall saplings as singing perches. Tall saplings usually occur as scattered plants within the clear cut between three to 10 years after clear cutting. Though this certainly varies by site, as a general pattern, young forest structure is disappearing from most clear cuts by year 10 and is usually absent by year 15. For most birds, the transition out of the young forest stage is recognized most clearly when saplings at least 15 feet tall have formed a nearly continuous mid-story canopy that effectively captures nearly all of the sunlight entering the stand. This simplifies the habitat structure by effectively shading out the shrub and ground cover layer. At this point, the stand is no longer shrubland or young forest as far as birds are concerned. During the stem exclusion stage, the forest is in a period of transition where the structure is not quite young forest and it's not quite mature forest. Bird species diversity tends to be lowest in the stem exclusion stage, but you'll see in a moment that there are birds that do regularly use this habitat, and we obviously need to let forest stands progress through this stage if we want them to develop into older age classes. So as far as birds are concerned, when does a forest stand become mature forest? 
Again, this varies with the specific forest, but mature forest structure and mature forest birds usually start to appear late in the stem exclusion stage, and the bird community becomes more diverse as the stand ages. This mature stand will now support a community of mature forest birds until there is another natural or human-caused disturbance that removes a large area of the overstory and sets back succession. The most obvious structural feature of mature forest habitat is a stand dominated by an overstory of tall trees. The presence of large diameter trees, specifically trees greater than 12 inches in diameter, is a structural feature that is specific to mature forest habitats, and these features typify the dominant habitat structure preferred by mature forest birds. While some mature forest birds will use stands with a canopy closure as low as 30%, Many species prefer forests where the canopy is at least 75% closed, but this varies among bird species. As forest stands continue to mature, the presence of cavity trees, trees with large dead limbs, and standing dead trees or snags provide required foraging and nesting habitat for numerous birds, including smaller bodied species such as black-capped chickadee, tufted titmouse, nuthatches, and downy woodpecker. Larger birds, including pileated woodpecker, barred owl, and wood ducks, will be more common in older forest stands that have cavity trees and snags greater than 18 inches in diameter. Immature forests have mid-story and shrub layers that range from absent to dense, depending on the forest type, stand age, and the degree of canopy openness that influences how much light can penetrate into the stand and support the development of lower plant layers. Now, as humans, we like to categorize things in neat and tidy boxes, but that's not how nature works. In reality, these four stages and their characteristic structures transition into one another gradually over time as the forest matures. And as a result, the bird community using a forest also changes gradually as the forest transitions over time, with certain bird species expected and encountered most commonly in young regenerating stands, some species that are often abundant and encountered regularly in sapling and pole sized stands, and others that are most abundant in mature forest stands. But note that while most bird species tend to be most abundant in forests of a certain age class, many birds require or prefer a combination of both young forest and mature forests to meet all of their habitat needs. So what's this all mean? It means that if we want to maintain the current diversity of bird species that occur on our landscape, we need to maintain all forest age classes somewhere on the landscape. Here an edit is required to reiterate that maintaining a full diversity of forest age classes is what's needed if we want to maintain the full diversity of vertebrate and invertebrate wildlife species on our landscape. This is becoming increasingly challenging in some landscapes as development reduces habitats into smaller and smaller fragments. This makes it particularly challenging to meet the needs of numerous bird species that are experiencing rapid population declines. Because many young forest and mature forest birds are area sensitive, meaning that they are uncommon or they suffer poor reproductive success in small habitat patches. So how big of a habitat patch is big enough? For young forest birds, there are three species that will occur in shrubby forest openings as small as a third of an acre. These are the common yellowthroat, the chestnut-sided warbler, and the morning warbler. These species have been termed gapped specialists in that they likely evolved with the ability to nest in the shrubby areas created when large old-growth trees fell and let sun through canopy gaps. These birds prefer larger openings, but they can breed in pretty small shrubby gaps. These species are really exceptions though, because most young forest birds are uncommon in openings less than two acres in size. And if you're in a landscape dominated by mature forest where there aren't other large young forest habitats within a mile or so, you probably need to make openings at least five to 10 acres if you want to create young forest habitat that not only attracts, but that can actually support a breeding population of young forest birds. These birds that require large, dry shrubland habitats, in other words, they don't breed in shrub wetlands, would have been abundant following large natural disturbances such as the 1938 hurricane, and they likely evolved in close association with pine oak barrens, dry ridge tops, 
and or coastal dunes that were maintained in a perpetual shrubby condition by fire and harsh growing conditions. These habitats have been nearly eliminated from our landscape due to development and fire suppression, so these birds now depend on human-created shrublands as their habitat. Unfortunately, cutting large areas of mature forest to make functioning nesting habitat for shrubland birds invariably results in a 50 to 80 year loss of mature forest structure that mature forest birds require for nesting. This trade-off needs to be considered carefully if you are planning large clearings specifically for the purpose of benefiting wildlife, because many of our mature forest birds also are area sensitive, and they suffer poor reproductive success when forced to breed in forest tracts that are too small to meet their needs. This is due largely to increased risk of nest predation, as well as nest parasitism by brown-headed cowbirds that lay their eggs in other birds' nests. These risks increase as the proportion of suburban development and agriculture in the landscape increase, but unfortunately, we don't have a good handle on just how large a forest tract needs to be to function as high-quality breeding habitat for a diversity of mature forest birds. The suggested minimum forest acreage required by mature forest birds varies among studies, and ranges from less than 100 acres to over 250 acres required to support a sustainable breeding population of an individual species and probably well over 250 acres if we want the forest to accommodate the needs of all the mature forest species that are likely to breed in the area. Importantly, this does not mean there should be no timber harvesting in these areas being managed for mature forest birds. It just means we should use silviculture methods that maintain and enhance mature forest structure by removing trees in smaller groups, which can greatly enhance nesting and foraging habitat in the mid-aged forests that currently dominate the New England landscape. For example, we can use timber harvesting as the tool for maintaining and enhancing forest layers and plant species diversity at multiple scales, such as looking for opportunities to create or maintain softwood inclusions in extensive hardwood stands to attract and support bird species that would otherwise be absent without this habitat diversity. Okay, I want to do a quick recap before moving on because the information I just presented covered a number of important concepts that we want to keep in mind anytime we are planning a timber harvest aimed at maintaining and enhancing habitat for wildlife. I introduced the habitat role and importance of plant structure and plant species composition, and I used the response of birds to differences in plant structure to define young forest versus mature forest age classes. I used birds because they are the wildlife that tends to be the most specific to certain age classes. You'll learn in a moment how other wildlife occur in either young forest or mature forest as long as those habitats contain specific microhabitat features. And I introduced the importance of considering plant structure, plant species, and forest age class diversity at multiple scales, including within each stand, across multiple stands on a property, and across multiple properties within the landscape. I also use the minimum area requirements of birds to explain the importance of habitat patch size. Again, I used birds to define this because if we can meet the minimum area requirements of both young forest and mature forest birds within a landscape, we should be able to meet the minimum area requirements of most mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. At the end of the presentation, I will provide my thoughts for where on the landscape we might prioritize big blocks of young forest and big blocks of mature forest habitat. But now I'm going to end section two by providing a very brief summary of the specific habitat features we need to consider for mammals, amphibians, and reptiles. Overall, there are 49 species of mammals that use forested habitats in New Hampshire. This includes eight species of bats that regularly occur in forests. Bats piece together a combination of mature forest, young forest, and other open habitat types within a landscape of a few miles to meet their different life needs. During the day, bats roost in live or dead trees that have cavities, crevices, or loose bark. Each bat species has different preferences for the type of tree they prefer for roosting, and most bats use a number of different roost trees positioned either deep within the forest or exposed within or along the edges of forest openings. So retaining a variety of different cavity trees in different landscape positions is perhaps the easiest way to benefit bats. 
In the evening and at night, bats fly to open habitats to forage on insects. These habitats include lakes, ponds, and beaver wetlands, fields, and regenerating small group selection openings or larger clear cuts. So having such openings on the property or somewhere on nearby properties is critically important to bats. Group selection openings one quarter acre or larger are likely to support a greater diversity of plant species and thus a greater diversity and abundance of flying insects in smaller openings. So young forest openings at least one quarter acre likely provide the best foraging habitat for bats. We have four species of tree squirrels that require specific habitat components that most typically occur in older age class forests. Gray squirrels and southern flying squirrels prefer deciduous forests or mixed forests with a large component of deciduous trees. Red squirrels prefer coniferous forests or mixed forests with a large component of conifers. And northern flying squirrels use both coniferous and deciduous forests equally. The specific habitat components these squirrels require are large diameter trees with cavities that are used for nesting, especially in winter. The gray squirrels also make leaf nests in the crowns of large deciduous trees, and the flying squirrels make leaf and stick nests in conifers. The tree squirrels also require mature mast producing trees, such as oak, beech, and hickory, and the red squirrels require mature softwood trees that produce abundant cones. So identify and develop diverse stands of mast producing trees over time and then retain and crown thin healthy mast and cone producers to give them the sunlight they need to produce abundant seed crops. This is an effective way to enhance habitat for tree squirrels and many other wildlife. There are 16 species of small mammals that regularly occur in forested habitats in New Hampshire. Now, while each of these species has its own habitat requirements, as a group, these species will occur in a variety of mature and young forest habitats as long as the microhabitats they require are present. Most of the small mammals prefer cool and moist microhabitats that are near water or moist, well-drained soils. Also, because they are major prey items for many predators, the small mammals are most abundant in habitat patches that contain specific habitat features that function as cover objects, such as surface rocks with crevices, decaying logs and stumps, exposed roots and cavities under roots, which are common where trees grow shallow rooted on moist soils, and patches of dense shrubs and herbaceous ground cover that not only provide cover, but also food in the way of insects, fruits, and seeds. Also, many small mammals tend to occur in their greatest abundance in hardwood stands, likely due to the thicker and less acidic leaf litter that provides better cover, moisture, and invertebrate food resources than the litter in conifer stands. Maintaining and encouraging small hardwood inclusions within extensive conifer stands may be an effective way to enhance small mammal abundance across a landscape. This is important for small mammals, but also for avian and mammalian predators that rely on small mammals as food, particularly the weasels, bobcat, and lynx. These predators range through a variety of habitat types on the landscape, and in each habitat they spend the vast majority of their time near the specific microhabitats of cover that we just learned support abundant small mammals. The American Martin, Fisher, and Long-Tailed Weasel tend to prefer mature forest habitat with a pretty closed canopy and abundant coarse woody material. Ermine, bobcat, and lynx prefer young forest habitats and shrub wetlands with open overstory and dense shrubs. And mink and river otters occur most typically in riparian areas with abundant fallen logs and shrub cover, in areas that are usually best reserved as wetland buffers with no or only very minimal timber harvesting. All of these species also require den sites, which for any of them may include hollow logs, rock crevices, slash and stump piles, and abandoned burrows, or large diameter cavity trees for marten, fisher, long tail weasel, and ermine. And just like the previous predators that require a landscape with a diversity of habitats, managing for the omnivores and herbivores requires a landscape perspective because collectively, these species require a wide variety of habitat types, forest age classes, and microhabitats throughout the year. And it is unlikely that these species will be able to meet their needs on a single ownership. So managing your land to provide habitat components not available elsewhere is critical for these species. 
I'll end the discussion of mammals with the beaver, which because of their dam building habits, is perhaps one of the most important wildlife species for creating unique habitats and enhancing habitat diversity for other wildlife. Beavers are most likely to create ponds where slow moving streams flow through areas of level topography that support an abundance of deciduous shrub and sapling species, which serve as the primary food of beavers from autumn through spring. If beavers run out of food, they will abandon the pond, which will eventually drain and then progress naturally through a variety of successional stages that support many wetland and young forest adapted wildlife species. If we want to keep beavers in a wetland or attract them back to a wetland they have abandoned, we can use timber harvesting to create small group openings immediately adjacent to the wetland that will regenerate with an abundance of young woody plants. These openings are best located where the ground is relatively flat and dominated with hardwoods such as aspen or red maple because these trees readily sprout from their stumps or roots following harvesting. These openings need to be created following established best management practices and only after securing the permitting required to make openings adjacent to wetlands. Alternatively, if you don't want to encourage beavers to return to a wetland, locate openings that will regenerate with abundant browse at least a few hundred feet away from a wetland or slow moving stream. All right, I'll end section two with just a few considerations pertaining to amphibians and reptiles. This is a group of species for which we don't usually conduct timber harvesting specifically. In other words, I can't remember a time where I've prescribed timber harvesting for the sole purpose of creating or enhancing habitat for amphibians or reptiles. However, cutting trees can definitely affect habitat quality for these species, either positively or negatively. So it's important to keep these species in mind when we are planning and implementing any timber sale. Depending on where you are in New Hampshire, there are as many as 17 species of amphibians that use forested habitats. The northern redback salamander is the only amphibian in New England that doesn't breed in wetlands. They lay their eggs on land and prefer mature closed canopy forests with moist, well-drained soils, deep leaf litter, and large decaying logs. In New Hampshire, we have three species of stream salamanders that are closely associated with streams or woodland seeps, and they can be found in mature forest habitats within 100 or so yards adjacent to these wet habitats. We have six species of vernal pool amphibians that spend most of the year in mature forest habitats, primarily within 500 yards of the ephemeral wetlands that they require for breeding. And a number of other amphibians breed in a variety of different wetland types, but they can all be found throughout mature forest and in young forest habitats. For all of the amphibians, just remember that when they are in the forest, they require the same types of microhabitats that small mammals require. Cool, moist soils with abundant cover objects and patches of dense shrub and herbaceous cover. And we have 14 reptiles that often occur in forests, including eight species of snakes that are common enough to be expected in forest habitats that most of us are likely to be working in. Most of the snakes prefer landscapes where there are a diversity of habitat types in close juxtaposition within a half mile or less. These habitats include shady mature forests with closed canopy or small canopy gaps, wetland edges with complex vegetation in the shrub and ground cover layer, and both shrub dominated and herb dominated openings where the shrub layer and ground cover layer is patchy, with some areas that are exposed and sunny for basking, immediately adjacent to very dense patches that provide snakes with shade, cover from predators, and an abundance of small mammals, amphibians, and insects that are their primary prey. And when in the forest, it should come as no surprise that snakes spend much of their time in and around the exact same microhabitats used by small mammals and amphibians. Snakes are here to hunt these prey, but also to avoid predators, regulate their body temperature during different weather conditions, lay their eggs, and hibernate. So an obvious take home message is that these structural features in our forest provide critically valuable habitat for a variety of wildlife species, and we can maintain and enhance these features while timber harvesting. For example, maintain existing canopy cover over low, cool, moist environments, and where there are surface stones and rock outcroppings, maintain the current canopy cover. If it is closed, keep it closed. 
and if these features are in canopy gaps, maintain those canopy gaps. Root skitter trails and logging equipment in a way that will avoid or minimize damage to decaying stumps or compaction of root cavities. Similarly, do your best to minimize damage to large fallen logs because they are uncommon in most forests. And consider adding these features by dropping some large trees and leaving them on the ground in stands where large woody material is absent. And use single tree and small group openings to create and maintain patches of shrub and herb cover in different areas of the property, including in some areas where the soil is moist and others where it is dry, to support a diversity of plant species. And finally, we have six species of turtles that can be expected in forested habitats, and these are the Blandings, Snapping, Eastern Box, Painted, Spotted, and Wood Turtles. All of these turtles prefer to nest in bare, dry, sandy, or gravelly soils that are completely exposed to sunlight for most of the day. From a forestry standpoint, it's important to realize that turtles may travel a half a mile or more from their wetland habitats to nest, so this means that turtles can occur far into the forest. When all species are considered, the turtle nesting season occurs from April through July, with young emerging from July to October, or overwintering in the nest and emerging the following spring. Log landings are a common area for turtles to nest, so rather than seeding landings to close out a job, consider allowing them to revegetate naturally in areas where erosion isn't a concern. Many turtles also travel through the forest specifically to get to vernal pools, where they feed on amphibian eggs and estivate in the water or forage and rest in the forest around the vernal pool during summer. Turtles are vulnerable to getting crushed by logging equipment when they are in the forest, and the loss of even a single breeding female may significantly reduce the population viability of spotted turtles and Blanding's turtles. So whenever you are planning a timber harvest, know what types of wetlands are on the property and in the surrounding landscape. This gives you a good idea for what amphibians and reptiles may be using different areas of the forest where you're planning the harvest. Known locations of threatened or endangered turtles should come up in a New Hampshire Natural Heritage Bureau data check when you are preparing permits for a timber sale. If your property is in New Hampshire and you're planning a timber harvest where blandings or spotted turtles are likely to occur, try to plan the timber harvesting between September 15th and April 1st. And if wood turtles are expected on your property, ideally plan timber harvest to occur between October 15th and April 1st. Timber harvesting during these dates will greatly minimize the chance of a rare turtle being harmed during the timber harvest. As a general rule, I really don't like to open up the canopy around streams, vernal pools, or wet seeps in the woods. If these areas are shady, I like to keep them shady by simply not cutting trees in a manner that causes them to be exposed to a drastic increase in sunlight. In the publication Good Forestry in the Granite State, we have provided detailed recommended timber harvesting buffers around vernal pools and many other voluntary best management practices for how to conduct timber harvesting in a manner that will be most beneficial to the forest amphibians and reptiles. Okay, so now that you have some background for how different groups of wildlife select their habitat and respond to changes in habitat structure, you probably already have some ideas for how you would use different silvicultural treatments to maintain and enhance habitat for different wildlife species. In this last section of the presentation, I'll bring all of the previous info together and summarize how different silviculture methods can be used to accomplish specific wildlife habitat management goals. Let's first get a few basic definitions out of the way, because I often hear confusion in how the different silviculture methods are discussed and applied. Technically, single tree selection and group selection are uneven aged silviculture systems that are used to establish and maintain indefinitely at least three tree age cohorts within a given forest stand. And the clear cutting and shelter wood methods are even aged silviculture systems that are used to regenerate an even aged forest stand, either via one complete harvest in the case of clear cutting or through a gradual removal of the overstory in two or three harvests in a shelter wood. However, when reviewing timber and habitat management prescriptions, I find that the technical silvicultural application of group selection and clear cutting often gets a bit muddled. 
and that group selection openings are often managed as individual stands, rather than openings that are part of a larger, uneven age stand composed of multiple group openings. If you are considering and treating a group selection opening as an individual for a stand, then by technical definition that makes the opening a clear cut rather than a group selection. Okay, so here's a pop quiz. From a silviculture standpoint, how large does an opening need to be before it is too big to be considered a group opening? Again, technically, these methods aren't defined by the size of the opening. They are defined by the forest age class structure they are used to develop within a single forest stand. So from a strict silviculture standpoint, a group selection can be any size if it is being used to develop and maintain uneven age conditions within a larger delineated forest stand. And technically, a clear cut can be any size if the opening is managed and delineated as one even aged stand. The way opening size is often discussed and applied in the field is somewhat non-technical from a silviculture standpoint, yet we regularly use silviculture-like terms, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone. In practice, I find that most foresters use a bit of an arbitrary cutoff and call any opening up to two acres a group cut, a patch cut, or a group, and any opening larger than two acres or so a clear cut. At the end of the day, I guess we can call these things whatever we want, but inconsistent use of terms can lead to confusion when people are reviewing forest management plans, and especially when young professionals are trying to grasp the technical application of our science. And so with that out of the way, I'm going to give you my definitions of these methods. I'm going to define each of these methods based on how they are typically applied on the ground, and on the specific habitat structure they create within a given forest stand. I'm going to stay as true as possible to how these terms are used in a technical silvicultural application. And I'll give a few examples for how each method can be applied to create and maintain habitat for a variety of the wildlife that use our forests. Single tree selection is an uneven aged method used to develop and maintain uneven aged or multi-aged mature forest structure. In each timber harvest, overstory and or midstory trees are removed as individual trees or in micro groups of two to five trees. So this harvesting method maintains the greatest canopy and midstory cover of any method. As such, this method tends to support a wildlife community most closely associated with mature forest conditions, and it is the timber harvesting method that is the least likely to result in a noticeable change in the wildlife community following timber harvesting. This method is the least likely to attract wildlife species that don't already occur on the property, but it can be an effective method for enhancing cover and foraging opportunities for wildlife already using the property. This method is effective for thinning the crowns of mature mass-producing trees to enhance their seed production, and for releasing young mass producers to recruit them into the canopy layer over time. Single tree selection gaps can be used to develop and maintain a patchy shrub layer preferred by nesting birds, small mammals, snakes, and frogs, or to establish and maintain a dense shrub and midstory layer preferred by snowshoe hares and bobcats. Finally, single tree selection is a preferred method for maintaining ideal core shelter in mature hemlock and spruce fir stands used as wintering areas by deer. And in these habitats, the goal is to maintain 75% softwood crown closure and dense conifer cover in every layer of the stand to catch snow above the ground and slow wind moving through the stand. Now we move to group openings which is where the entire overstory and midstory layer is removed in groups up to two acres. And based on how you apply group openings silviculturally, they can be used to create either even-aged or multi-aged forest stands. To wildlife, what's most important here is the size of the opening. The two acre maximum size isn't arbitrary, but is based on how the wildlife community typically responds to opening size. 
Specifically, numerous research projects have found that the community of mature forest birds changes very little in response to timber harvesting that removes trees in groups up to two acres. So the primary wildlife species that benefit from group openings are those that are most closely associated with mature forest conditions, with smaller group openings creating a lesser amount of change in forest structure across the overall stand than openings that approach two acres. However, group openings will often pull in a few species of young forest birds that weren't on the property before the harvest. These are the chestnut-sided warbler, common yellowthroat, and morning warbler. These birds are most likely to show up in openings over one acre, especially if they were already in habitat somewhere within the local landscape. A variety of young forest bird species may appear in group openings if there are larger clear cuts or shrubby transmission line rights of way within a half a mile of where you are making a new group opening. And as a note, Shrub-dominated rights-of-way greater than 200 feet wide are those that are most likely to support a diversity of young forest bird species. Overall, group openings can be a very effective way to enhance forest plant layer and plant species diversity that enhance cover and foraging opportunities for the wildlife that are already using a property. Specifically, the extra sunlight these openings let in supports a greater diversity of herbaceous, shrub, and regenerating tree species than the smaller openings created with single tree selection. And openings one quarter acre or larger are most likely to regenerate with a diversity of plant species. When locating group openings, we often have numerous options for which specific trees we choose to remove or retain. To help in these decisions, use the presence of established mast producing shrubs in the understory to help guide you for where to remove overstory trees. By removing trees that overtop or otherwise shade mast producing shrubs, we can provide those shrubs with the sunlight energy they need to flower and produce abundant fruits and seeds, adding to the habitat benefits we create when tending developing forest stands. It's a common practice to locate group openings around mass producing trees to provide them with growing room and encourage them to seed into the opening. From a habitat and forest regeneration standpoint, if the openings you make are less than about an acre, it's usually best to retain your mass producing trees along the edges of the openings rather than scattered within the opening. In small openings, trees retained within the opening often end up casting too much shade, and this can result in the openings regenerating slowly and becoming dominated by shade-tolerant tree species or invasive glossy buckthorn. In group openings larger than one acre, it's okay to retain a mature mass tree or two within the opening, but be careful here because large crown trees can easily cast too much shade. You can leave dead trees in openings of any size because these won't inhibit regeneration. High plant diversity in group openings over one quarter acre usually means high insect diversity and abundance. These openings also tend to warm up earlier in the morning and have higher overall insect activity than in the surrounding forest. As a result, many mature forest birds regularly incorporate group openings into their territory to eat the abundant insects and the males of many species seem to prefer to sing from the treetops along the edge of openings. Turkeys, grouse, and some mature forest birds, including red-eyed vireos, black-throated blue warbler, and hermit thrush, will often nest in the dense cover of group openings. And when young birds leave the nest, mature forest birds from the surrounding forest usually bring their young into shrubby openings where they're able to avoid predators in the thick cover and grow rapidly by foraging on abundant insects and fruit. Shrubby openings between one quarter acre and one acre are probably the most appropriate size if your goal is to enhance cover and foraging opportunities for mature forest birds. The dense vegetation in these smaller openings also provides ideal cover and foraging habitat for small mammals, amphibians, and snakes. And due to the abundance of prey, Group openings provide preferred hunting areas for forest predators, including broadwing hawks, cooper's hawks, fisher, gray fox, and long-tailed weasels. And group openings located immediately adjacent to dense softwood cover can provide ideal winter foraging habitat for deer, 
and snowshoe hare. Now the way I define a clear cut from a wildlife perspective is when we remove the entire overstory and midstory layer in a blocky opening larger than two acres. Openings of this size are usually used to create even aged stands. And immediately, the wildlife that benefit the most from clear cutting tend to be species most closely associated with young forest habitats. Clear cutting is a method that results in the greatest change in the wildlife community following timber harvesting. And it is the method that creates the most obvious change in the bird community, due mainly to a change in nesting conditions. When the clear cut is created, nesting mature forest birds are displaced in the surrounding mature forest or they leave the immediate landscape. The mature forest birds are replaced in the clear cut by a community of nesting young forest birds that colonize a new habitat from other shrublands that could be nearby or many tens of miles away. Clear cutting is one of the most effective methods for creating large blocks of young forest structure required by young forest birds and clear cuts greater than 10 acres are most likely to function as high quality nesting habitat capable of supporting a viable local population of young forest birds. And in southern New Hampshire, we find that clear cuts at least 10 acres are necessary to provide endangered New England cottontails with enough cover to avoid predators. They simply get eaten in smaller openings. Clear cuts at least 10 acres are those most likely to be used as hunting habitat by open country raptors, including red-tailed hawks that nest in tall trees near the clear cut, American kestrels that would nest in large diameter cavity trees retained within or along the edges of the clear cut, and recent clear cuts over 20 acres may be used by rough-legged hawks that occur in New Hampshire only during winter. Bats, tree swallows, and whippoorwills are most likely to hunt flying insects over clear cuts with whippoorwills probably most likely to use clear cuts over five to 10 acres. In Northern New Hampshire, large clear cuts provide moose with abundant browse and are the preferred hunting and breeding habitat of Canada lynx. Research from UNH has shown that leaving abundant slash in clear cuts is an effective method for providing amphibians such as wood frogs with cool, moist refuges until the cut regenerates with dense herb and shrub cover. Another good way to maintain refuges for a variety of wildlife in recent clear cuts is to retain the established shrub layer whenever it won't inhibit goals to regenerate specific tree species. From a wildlife habitat standpoint, I'm less concerned about the silvicultural application of the shelter wood method and more interested in the two age forest structure that most foresters would recognize as characteristic of a first stage low density shelter wood harvest or a low density thinning. Here, overstory trees are removed in a manner that retains about 30 to 40% of the overstory and the residual trees are spaced widely enough that they don't cast enough shade to inhibit the development of a dense shrub layer. This two-age structure with a dense shrub layer below and scattered overstory trees above provides the best opportunity to accommodate a wildlife community composed of both young forest wildlife and mature forest wildlife in the same stand. When these stands are at least five acres, they usually support most of the young forest birds that could be expected to use the specific site of the harvest. The residual tree cover usually supports some component of the mature forest bird community, with scarlet tanager, great crested flycatcher, red-eyed vireo, pine warbler, and veery regularly encountered in these stands. Retaining snags and any large diameter trees with visible cavities can greatly increase the likelihood that cavity nesters including northern flickers, hairy woodpeckers, pileated woodpeckers, and white-breasted nuthatches will use these stands. As well as bats that would likely roost in the trees retained within the stand. The open structure of the overstory will usually allow even the larger, less maneuverable bats to forage for flying insects within these stands. Some mature forest birds will avoid nesting in these stands, but the presence of the overstory trees makes it more likely that they and their fledglings will use these stands while foraging. We can encourage a larger component of the mature forest birds by retaining a greater proportion of the overstory, 
but at some point this results in not enough light to support the dense shrub layer required by the young forest birds. So the shelter wood structure isn't perfect, but it's often the best option if the goal is to accommodate a variety of young forest and mature forest birds in the same stand. So I'll leave you with a few final thoughts. I've explained that maintaining a diversity of wildlife on the landscape requires a diversity of forest conditions. I think the best way for us to accomplish this goal is to apply ecologically sound, sustainable silviculture methods that are appropriate for each forest type and site we work with. Use the silviculture to help guide where openings of different sizes and types are most appropriate on the landscape. But if you are planning and trying to locate openings with the primary intent of benefiting wildlife, here's the general approach I take to help guide the decisions. The vast majority of wildlife that use shrubby habitats for cover and foraging will be able to meet these needs in group openings two acres in size or smaller. Therefore, if you are making openings with the primary intent of benefiting a diversity of wildlife, I suggest that most of your wildlife openings be two acres or smaller, and that you rely on silviculture objectives to dictate when and where openings larger than two acres are most appropriate. If larger openings don't make silvicultural sense, they often don't make sense for enhancing wildlife habitat. However, if you are making an opening with the specific intent of attracting and supporting area-sensitive young forest wildlife, particularly birds, then I recommend that you create a clear cut or a low density thinning that is much larger than two acres. Otherwise your opening won't be large enough to really benefit these target wildlife species and you may reduce the functionality of mature forest habitat. To benefit these birds, in landscapes where there are other large clear cuts, low density thinnings, or transmission line rights of way within a mile or so of your property, I recommend that any new opening you create be at least five acres. And in rural landscapes dominated by mature forest where these other shrublands aren't nearby, I recommend you create openings at least 10 acres. In both landscapes, we need to be strategic about where we locate large openings. So we create functional young forest habitat while maintaining the integrity and functionality of mature forest habitats. Here's a few suggestions for how we might accomplish this within the same landscape. As a general rule, if the primary reason for creating large openings is to benefit young forest wildlife, I suggest locating large openings along the periphery of unfragmented forest blocks rather than in the center. If there are existing clear cuts, low density thinnings, or transmission line rights of way on or near your property, Locate new openings as close as possible to these other habitats, and ideally, clustered where you can plan a series of openings across future commercial timber sales, with new openings created about every 10 to 15 years. Clustering young forest openings is perhaps the best way to enhance the ability of your openings to function as young forest habitat and it increases the opportunity to maintain and enhance high quality interior mature forest habitat in the same landscape. Consider at least loosely designating interior mature forest areas near the center of each forest block. Where the mature forest is away from edges with large shrub openings, fields, roads, or other development. Manage these interior areas primarily with single tree selection and group openings up to one acre in size to create and maintain uneven aged forest structure. Use silvics and silvicultural objectives to determine if and where larger group openings are more appropriate. The basic approach I just described can be applied at most forest scales. But if you're working on a landscape where you can't create a five acre clear cut, without reducing the remaining mature forest block below 250 acres, consider managing the entire property as mature forest habitat and use single tree selection and group openings to enhance mature forest structure. In these smaller landscapes, I think it's important to limit the number of large group openings you locate within the interior forest areas. 
because from a habitat standpoint, we don't want to Swiss cheese our interior mature forest with large group openings. Because at some point, adding too many large openings will reduce the ability of this area to function as mature forest habitat for wildlife that prefer closed or nearly closed canopy conditions. So just be aware of how you position different size group openings in these areas. I think a good approach is to locate most or all of your largest group openings outside of the interior forest areas and position them instead near existing openings, such as groups created during a previous timber harvest, transmission line rights away, field edges, and perhaps near beaver ponds to encourage beavers to remain within a wetland or return to one they have abandoned. This approach is an effective way to maximize the habitat value of group openings and enhance existing shrub habitats in any landscape where you decide large clear cuts or low density thinnings aren't appropriate. Again, use the silviculture and site conditions to help you best locate these openings and determine the most appropriate opening size. As you are planning any timber harvest, I encourage you to check out the publication Good Forestry in the Granite State, where we have provided a comprehensive set of recommended voluntary best management practices for harvesting timber in a manner that will be most beneficial to wildlife and other forest resources. I would welcome an opportunity to join you in the field and discuss options for maintaining and enhancing wildlife habitat on any property you are working on in New Hampshire please don't hesitate to contact me or any of my colleagues at UNH Cooperative Extension or at the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. We would be happy to assist you in your efforts to steward our forest, wetland, and wildlife resources.